We serve a mighty God. We serve an all-powerful God. And yesterday I had the opportunity to remember 28 years ago when I landed in Charlotte, North Carolina for the first time in my life. Never has been in North Carolina. It was a Saturday also. It was June 1996, and yesterday was 28 years that I came. And uh, I, as I was preparing this study, I remember that it's the third time I study the book of Revelation. And this is the first time I teach it in English. I've done it twice in Spanish. First one, I was 16 years old. By the way, we didn't have pastor in that church. And they asked me to teach a Bible study on, I think, Wednesdays or Fridays. I cannot remember. And they said, why don't you teach Revelation? I got a couple of books and started doing it. The last time I did it, the second time was because before the Y2K, 1999, I found some books. And I prepared that the Spanish church in Concord was packed. A lot of people asking questions. They wanted to know what was going to happen. Um, it's interesting to talk about the future. It's, it's amazing. It's fun. It's dangerous. Some people say, Why, how are you going to start Revelation? It's a very confusing book. Well, my dad's name is Samuel, and we grew up in Venezuela. He was a very smart person. He is a very smart person. He is homebound now. He doesn't go in much places, but... I remember that on Sunday after church, around 1, 1.30, we had on TV uh, a game called the Game of the Week. When it came to America, I saw that they have also here the Game of the Week. But it was one baseball game we, had to, we could see on, on TV on su- Sundays at 1. I remember that. And one day, I cannot remember the teams. You don't, don't, I don't know what teams were. That was 1974, 75, something like that. And my dad says, I think that player is going to be changed. They're going to replace him for somebody else. Yes, they changed the picture. Wow, my dad can tell the future. That's amazing. <laughs> he said, I think he's going to be struck out. And he, the guy, the batter, got struck out. He said, my dad can really know. Dad, you really know baseball. Okay, so that went that Sunday, two or three Sundays later, the same. Dad is looking at the news, and I'm watching the game, and the dad says, I think he's going to score a home run. And boom, there you go. The ball is over the field. My dad is a prophet. <laughs> So next week on Sunday, I got the newspaper and saw that the sports, they had a lot of games that happened Saturday night. <laughs> and what we had on TV in Venezuela in 1970-something, 75, was a game that was played Saturday. They called it the game of the week. <laughs> My dad found out, and he was just teasing us. Josh Billings, one of America's humorists, says, never predict the future. Never predict the future. Never. Okay, that's a humorist. This is not a Bible. Please, this is not a Bible. This is a humorist. It says, if you prophesy right, nobody will remember it. But if you prophesy wrong, nobody will forget it. So it's a risky thing to prophesy. I'm not going to prophesy. I'm going to read what the Bible is. My goal here is that we discover Jesus as he is. When we talk about Jesus, we, come in, he, we see him coming out of the grave, glorious, with a body, and his disciples around him. When we talk about Jesus, we think in a baby. Oh, the baby Jesus in a manger. When we talk about Jesus, we see powerfully him walking over waters. When we talk about Jesus, we have so many pictures of Jesus, but not the present revelation, disclosure of Jesus. What I want through this study, and I don't know how it's going to last, because last time I was like two years on this study. I don't care. We can change it to Wednesday nights or Sunday nights or online. I I mean, we can do many things. But we're going to start today and learn about the revelation, how he uncovers himself. How is Jesus really right now? And I pray that you fall in love with him. Because John, when he saw him, he did not fall in love. He was scared. He fell down, dead, like dead. John, I pray that you're not amazed with the revelation of Jesus Christ, that you're not afraid, but you want to follow him. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to obey him. I want to do what he says. And we're going to read today just only three verses. That's wonderful. Three verses, a short sermon. (laughs) And it's on Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. It says in Revelation 1, Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon to Take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. 
Blessed is the one who reads out loud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what it is written in it because the time is near. If we look at Jesus in the times when he was here in the gospel, Jesus had a strange motto that you will not believe. He said, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell. You can see, shh, don't tell. You got healed from leprosy. Don't tell, don't tell. It was like a secret. And we read that and say, if Jesus wants people to believe in him, why is he saying don't tell? Matthew 8, 1 through 4. Then Jesus told him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that God, that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Jesus just healed a person. He said, don't show, don't, don't, don't tell others. Just go to the priest and follow what the law says. Jesus came to abide by the law. So he's not revealing himself. He's not manifesting who he is. He just wants to be the one God, God sent. Matthew 16, 20. After he comes from the mountain, the disciples have seen the glory of Jesus shining. His face completely transformed. His clothes became uh, from ordinary to very white that no washers can wash that, that clean, brighter than snow. And then he gives this command, Matthew 16, 20. Then he gave the disciples order to tell no one that he was the Messiah. Don't tell anybody what you have seen until Jesus has resurrected. Look at Matthew 17, 9. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So it's kind of a secret that Jesus had. Jesus wanted people to believe by faith that what they have seen, what they have heard in, in Saturday school, they didn't have Sunday school, but what they heard in, in church, in the synagogue, was the fulfilling. He was a 3D version of what they have learned before. As they, as they saw Jesus walking, they had to, wow, I've heard that before. I've seen that. Where, where, where? Oh, in the Bible. He is the fulfilling of all prophecies. So we... We see Jesus, here is called for the verse 1, the revelation. Um, Amos 3, 7, well, yeah, why do we, why do we uh, study, why was we study this prophecy? The revelation, like it says right here. Amos 3, 7 tells us that for, for the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So there is a revelation, there is a manifestation of God through Jesus, and he wants to reveal it to his servants, the prophets. Uh, Psalm 25, 14 agrees with Amos 3, 7, because it says, The friendship of the Lord is to those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. God is different to any pagan god. Pagan gods, you cannot tell what they're thinking. You don't know what's happening. If we share the gospel with our Muslim friends, they'll tell you that they don't know how Allah is today. If he's upset, they might get killed. If he's happy, they might be, have a good day. But they, they, it's unpredictable. They don't know how to talk with him or how to relate. They don't have to pray, but they know that they have to pray, but they don't know how he's going to come out. God is a God that wants to reveal and show us how he is. He expects us to learn from him, and he wants to be known by us. This revelation that we have here is, is different to what we have seen in the rest of the Bible. It opposes the New Testament, Jesus, because Jesus is trying to hide uh, who he really is, and here he is manifesting. He's openly telling, showing what he looks like. So the verse 1 says, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him. God gave Jesus this revelation to show it to John. In John 15, 15, we read the following. Jesus is telling his disciples, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. If I work in a company, rarely, if I'm, if I'm a work person, if I'm a laborer there, I don't know what they're doing upstairs. One day I receive the notice that they're selling the company or they're moving or that my job is changing from this department to another department. There's nothing I can do about it. I just have to obey because I just work there. With Jesus, Jesus is saying, I don't call you servants anymore. I want to show you what's going on. You're my friends because I can reveal you. I can explain it to you. You understand because you're my friends. Any friend of Jesus in here, any friend of Jesus in here, do you want to know what Jesus is planning? 
Do we want to listen to God? I think like a month ago I was explaining to you that God wants to talk to us. We can listen to him. We just many times don't have time. Many times we want to ordain ministers to listen to God. We want the, the Sunday school teachers to listen to God. Jesus is saying that he wants to reveal it to all his servants, and not call him servants anymore, call him friends. God, and we told this uh, like a month, two months ago, God called Abraham his, his friend because Abraham followed God. Wherever he went, he tried to communicate with God. So according to verse 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to him, to Jesus, to show his servants what must soon take place. Interesting, soon take place. Because in the prophetic outlook, the end is always imminent. We say soon. Soon is 2,000 years and nothing has happened. How are you studying that book? There has to be something wrong with Revelation. In the prophetic outlook, the end is always imminent. In biblical prophecy, temporal judgments are regularly expressed against the backdrop of the final eschatological events. Everything God does by way of judgment is to be understood in light of the final events. Events. So when he says it soon will take place, is everything is ready. Jesus has already died. He already resurrected. He already forgave the sins. So the next is co- that is coming is this revelation. Luke eighteen seven through eight says, "Will not God grant justice to His elect who cry out to Him day and night? Will He delay helping them? I tell you that He will swiftly grant them." Justice. You see, in the revelation, in the prophetic outlook, the end is always imminent. Even in Romans 16.20, the word of God says, Paul writes to the Romans and in 16.20, says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. When he says soon, it's because in the prophetic outlook, the end is always imminent. It's coming. It's going to happen. And also, in verse 1, there's something interesting. It says, His servant John. The end of verse 1 says, his servant John. Isn't this curious that John never reveals his name? When he writes the gospel, he says, the beloved disciple. When he writes 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, he never says that it's John who is writing. He says, to this person, to this person, but he never writes the word John. But here in the book of Revelation, he says very clearly, John. Paul used to do that. Peter used to do that at the beginning. Nowadays, if you write a letter, those that write letters, people now send emails or text messages. Sometimes you have to say, who's writing to me? Because you don't know who it is. <laughs> kind of John, kind of John. But when you wrote a letter, if you know what a letter is, or a postcard or a card, you, at the end you write your name. Okay, signature, love, so-and-so. I send it to you. In those times, in biblical times, people wrote their names at the beginning, so you know who's sending it. John never did that, but here in verse 1, he's writing his name, John. What was going on when he wrote his, his, this, this treatise, this, this book? What was happening? A lot of people were, were writing apocalyptic, were trying, were trying to future telling. Let me give an example. Let me give an example. Imagine that I go and dig somewhere in this church, books, and I say, oh, look what I found. Here's Pastor Brinkley writing that in the year uh, 2010, uh, 2018, there's going to be a pandemic. Look, and I bring it here and I read it to you. Pastor so-and-so in 1920 wrote that Brinkley, that, that, that there was going to be a COVID here in 2020. And you say, wow, he wrote that, and I faked the thing, and I put it together. And I find some other things and say that we had a president that uh, was an actor from 2016 to 2020. Let's say that, for example. And you say, wow, that really happened, and it's all forged. And it's all, all, I made it up, but I don't tell you. And they say, look, it looks like it is him, okay? So it's really fake, and that was happening in these times after the fall of Jerusalem. They were everywhere, all these kind of writings, trying to show that somebody else wrote it just to give prestige to the writing, just to make believe. Nowadays, if you watch movies, if you go to the, the movie theater, there are plenty of movies trying to show that Mary and Jesus and Mary Magdalene and things like that that happened 20 years ago, trying to forge things that never really happened. When John writes his name, he is saying, I'm the last of the apostles. All have died. This is John. This is nobody that is writing this before or after me. This is John. John 
the beloved apostle is writing this. So he is assuming all responsibility. By the way, when you study the book of Revelation, if you could study or learn it in Greek, the original, there are grammar mistakes, terrible mistakes. It would be like Jonas writing a book in English, and you come and say, Jonas, don't say you didn't eat. It you, that doesn't sound proper. You say you didn't eat. Oh, but it's in the past. No, no, no. One is, is good. You didn't eat. You didn't eat. Oh, okay. So I write it down. And you, scratch, scratch, scratch. You write it again. That was John. His language was not Greek. He made mistakes, and you say, why is it in the Bible we have mistakes? He's showing that he's a fisherman. He's showing that he's not a Greek professor. He's showing that he's not an expert, that he's not faking the document. He wrote the best he could with all the love, but with a direct, real, and clear revelation that it was really God who was showing him this. And I believe that the book of Revelation was written by John. So that is verse 1. Verse 2 says, Who, which is John, testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. John is telling us that what he saw, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament. Everything he did was to fulfill the Old Testament. The disciples were watching in 3D. Let me give you an example. When I say that they were watching in 3D, it's because they have heard the stories in, in, in the synagogue, in the church. They have heard uh, the stories about Moses, and, but they have heard the, the prophecy, but they have never seen it walking and moving. Let me give you an example. They have heard this prophecy. It's in Psalm 107, 25 to 31. The disciples, the people in John's time have heard this. Listen to this. He spoke, and this is Psalm 107, 107, 25. He spoke and raised a stormy wind that stirred up the waves of the sea. Rising up to the sky, sinking down to the depths, their courage melting away in anguish. That people are scared. Those people, this is some, this is before Jesus came. That people are scared. They reeled and staggered like a drunkard. And all their skills was useless. They were fishermen, but they could do nothing. This is Psalm 107 written years before Jesus. Then they cried out to the Lord, 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 save us in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They rejoiced when the waves grew quiet. Then he guided them to the harbor they longed for. Again, this is Psalm 107 for the fourth time. This is not the gospel. This is Psalm 107. They have heard this. They have learned it by memory. They believe it was going to happen sometime with the Messiah. Verse 31. Let them give thanks to the Lord for this faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. So they have heard it, but they have never seen it. Now he is in 3D before them, and his name is? Jesus. Jesus. Anybody awake? His name is Jesus. Mark 4, 35 through 41. Listen. Mark 4, 35 through 41. This is the fulfillment of this prophecy in Psalm 107. On that day, when evening had come, he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him alongside, along since he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. A great wisdom, windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still not have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So he got still and quiet and calm. And they were scared of Jesus and said, this is not a human being. Nobody can quiet the storm like he does. I'm telling you, Jesus is revealing himself in the book of Revelation. Some of my friends tell me, have you found Jesus? Have you found Jesus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. He's the fulfilling of scripture. And we're going through, that, through it. So when John is telling us that he testified of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw, is that he saw the fulfilling of many, 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 many prophecies in one person. In three years, he saw the fulfilling of all the teachings that he had since he was a kid. Wow, that has to be incredible. Because we have learned the Bible backwards, right? 
first of all, I learned about Jesus. Jesus was here, and he, he died, and he resurrected, so I know the, the ending is very nice. And then I learned that he was born, and that he did miracles. I learned all that. But I never heard that there were so many prophecies so accurately about him. For the disciples, for the Jews, it was different. It was backwards than how we read the Bible. First, they had the Old Testament. All these prophecies, all these events that pointed to Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything. And then Jesus shows up. And in three years, he is walking in 3D, in three dimensions. What they have heard, only have heard. Amen? So we got that clear about what John is saying. Verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Why is this blessing here? Do you know that in Bible times people could not read? Well, nowadays people don't read. In those times they could not. They didn't know how to read. Nobody told them the letters. This morning I had an interesting experience with the kids because I was teaching Sunday school to the children. And then the first two students that came could not read. And I have all these Bible verses to put together and scream and say, what am I going to do? These girls have never been in school. They don't, they don't know even the letters, so I had to make it up. Well, in Bible times, people did not read. There was one person or two that could read. So here is a blessing for the one who reads out loud, aloud the words of the prophecy. The one who reads the book of Revelation has a blessing. I want to have that blessing. Do you? <laughs> I want that blessing. And blessed are those who hear the words of the prophecy. Because in those times, there were just only people that heard, could not read it, but you could hear. So there is a blessing here for those that listen and for those that, uh, for those that hear. So there is a blessing for me and a blessing for you. Because I'm reading it and you're listening. You can also read it, okay? Because you, you, can, you learn how to read in English. Now, it's interesting that in the book of Revelation, there are seven blessing seven blessing i don't know what that number has to do but there's a lot of sevens in the bible what i can tell you is that the beatitudes the beatitudes in the book of matthew are nine some people say there are ten whatever number is fine go ahead and do that research but here in the book of Revelation are seven blessings number one we just read it the one who reads and the ones who uh, listens number two is in 1413 revelation 1413 it says blessed are the dead who die in the lord from now on we're going to go there eventually, okay? Not yet. We're not going to explain that right now. 1615, blessed is the one who is alert and remains clothed, so that he may not go around naked and people see his shame. 199, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. 26, 20, chapter 20, verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And 22.7, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And finally, 22.14, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city of gates. So, when you say the word revelation, or in Spanish, apocalypse, because it has apocalypse, people think that it's chaos. People think that it's catastrophe. There are blessings here. Let's open the book. There are many blessings, at least seven here. What happens is that we think that God's wrath is that God throws a tantrum. He gets upset. Oh, they didn't obey. You, know, you go to a supermarket and you see a kid that wanted some candy and they don't give it to him. When you get to the cashier, the kid is throwing, kicking, and hitting. We think that God's wrath is like that, that God got upset and he's kicking everything. So you see all these catastrophes and, and things going bad, bad, and you don't know what to do. And you think that Israel right now fighting against the rest of the world because it seems that every country is going to go against, the, against Israel. Is there a prophecy about that? Does the Bible say that all the countries are going to go against Israel? You want to read that. We want to learn how close we are to the second coming of Jesus Christ. I want to study the book of Revelation, but God doesn't throw a, a fit. He, he's, not, he's not having a tantrum or something like that. To my understanding, God's wrath is when he lets go. He lets go. We're going to get to that, but let me give you a, a previous coming attraction. God lets go. Oh, my, when God lets go. I don't, I don't, I don't want God to let me go. I've been behaving so bad, so bad. I've been doing this so many times that God says, okay, you are on your own. Find out. If that is so good that you like, go ahead. Don't call me. I'm not coming. God's wrath fell upon Saul, the king Saul. 
God said, I'm not, I'm not listening to you. And he tried, he tried, he even called Samuel after Samuel was dead. God did not answer. Eli, we just talked about him this morning, Sunday school. Eli also, God said, no more with you, Eli. Not with you and your children. I don't care about you. You're on your own. Some countries happened, this happened to some countries. I don't know if Venezuela, my country, is going through this. It's so terrible what's happening. I don't know if the United States someday is going to happen. This is God's wrath is going to say, okay, you're on your own. Go ahead. We are in time until God's wrath shows. He says, let's go. Let go. Not let's go. Let go. Let go. If you fly a kite, if you fly a kite, you need to pull and let go. Pull and let go. You don't let go because bye-bye, no more kite. You need to find another one. But to fly a kite, you need to pull and let go. So it goes up, but you still keep control. That is God keeping us close to him. God keeping close to him. He lets go and he comes. But his wrath is, okay, go ahead, let go. Why should we study the book of Revelations? We have four main reasons that I want to give you, and we're going to finish. First of all, because God gave it to his servants. I want to study the book of Revelation. You want to read the book of Revelation and study as much as you can and try to understand what can be understood because God gave it to his servants. It's a gift from God. What happens in Christmas? People give you something to give. You say, no, I don't take that. No, no, I don't take gifts. Anybody here says, I don't take gifts? <laughs> Everybody here takes gifts. Baby shower, weddings, anything. We give gifts, we give, Right? How do you tell God, no, I don't want that? It's a gift from God. The revelation of Jesus Christ is a give, God-given gift to his servants, to us. He doesn't call us servants anymore. He calls us friends. But it's something he gives to us, and we don't want to read it because we say, "Go, mm-mm, no, not for me, not for me. But if it's a gift from God, we should be reading it, even if we don't understand everything. Let me tell you something that theologians and, and Bible teachers say. You will understand as you obey the Bible. You will understand as you obey. When you say, no, I don't understand that, I don't read it, God kind of shuts, the Bible kind of shuts. No, I don't want to obey. I don't, I don't care about that because I understand. I'm afraid of that. But as I obey, what I can understand, what the little that I understand, I obey it, God gives me more wisdom, more revelation, more understanding. I don't claim to be a know-it-all. I don't think that I know much about prophecy. I'm not a student of prophecy, but I want to study the Bible with you. I want to study the Revelation because it's a gift from God, and I believe there are blessings. But number two, why should I study the book of Revelation? Number two, because Revelation is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I believe that God's word is powerful. Anybody believe that God's word is powerful? With his words, he grows universes. Yes, he says, May, let it be so, and the light is. Let it be the sun, and the sun is. How powerful he is. He can stop the wind. He can stop the sun. It's powerful. I want to study God's revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, because it's the word of God, and it's powerful. It's the testimony of Jesus. Why should I be writing, reading about politicians? Why should I be reading the lives of many good people, or baseball players, or any kind of feature? Yes, it's interesting. What about the testimony of Jesus Christ? Should I be reading and studying this? Yes. Fall in love with this? Yes. Of course. We're not going to understand everything because prophecy, let me see if you can see this. Hmm? One event and another event. We have two events here separate. But when you're in the past or in the present, you're trying to see the future, some events overlap. Isn't that right? You can probably not see both hands. You see part of one, part of the other one. But if you stand like this, like God is, hmm? you can see both events separated. That's why when Jesus came, people couldn't understand it. The disciples said, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? Because they had all the, the, the future, the present, whatever, overlapped. They were kind of, I don't know exactly what's going on. But God can see it this way. This goes first, this goes second, this goes third. So there are some things in prophecy we don't completely understand. Trust in the Lord. Believe him. He is good. Amen? He is good. He's not giving a fit. He's not just kicking things. No. He is good and he loves his people. He wants us to understand as much as we can. Plus, I also believe, this is a parenthesis, that God wrote some things in code in the Bible so the devil doesn't mess with it. He gets confused. He reads it and reads it backwards and puts it together and pitches the Bible and he doesn't find it. So it's fine. Let's try to understand what it is there. Number two. Number three, there is a blessing for those that read it. Who wants a blessing? Blessing is more than happiness. Maybe your Bible says happy. Ha blessing is high five. Blessing is cheers. Blessing is yes. Okay, that is a blessing. You did it good. 
So they're a blessing for those that, list, who, those that read and who those that listen. So I think I'm going to be blessed, at least with health, or my parents be blessed, or my children. That would be wonderful. And you be blessed. That's more, more important here. There is a blessing. That's why I want to under, uh, study the book of Revelation, because it's a gift from God to his servants, because it's the word of God and testimony of Jesus, because it has blessings. There is a blessing for those that hear and write, and also because the time is near. Look always to Israel. Look always to Israel, to Jerusalem. And you can tell the time is near. When the countries and the nations are against, when the gospel is reaching every tribe, every tongue, every language, the second coming is close. So if the time is near, we should be reading, studying the book of Revelation. It will increase our faith, we will grow in faith. It will will prompt us to share the gospel with others, not to scare them, to give them hope. I don't want to scare anybody. Well, if I have to scare people so they don't go to hell, I'll scare them. Hey, get out of there. Come come with Jesus. You're going the wrong path. I want this book to provoke us to missions, to provoke us to go reach the children, the adults, the grandparents, the lost generation. It provokes us to go and have compassion for them. It provokes us to pray for those that don't want to listen. That's what I want studying this book, not to scare people. When I was in college in Venezuela and some students, uh, some friends of mine in the School of Architecture learned that I read the Bible and studied, immediately they went to Revelation. They said, Jonas, where is the 666? Where's the Antichrist? Is it Ronald Reagan? Is it true that Ronald Reagan is a, look, six, he has six, and his middle name has six letters, and his last name has six. Is it Ronald Reagan? Can you imagine people thinking that <laughs> he's gone? Ronald Reagan is gone. And they said, no, no, he's the black pope, or the pope is coming. They're always trying to look for who is this guy in the Bible. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because when we prophesy, if we do it accurately, nobody will remember. If we do it wrong, everybody will will remember. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to study the Bible. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this revelation. Thank you, Father, because there are blessings and invitation for us to read it, to study, to teach it, to understand it. It's not easy, Father. Many, many figures, and thank you for those figures. But Lord, I want to, I, I want this church, this congregation to love you more love the lost as we study this book to dedicate our lives to you father if we're living an easy life a light christianity please lord forgive us help us to change help us to change and affect this community Let's start with the schools, with the children around us. Let's bless the nations that are coming to the United States. Let's bless them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with the forgiveness of their sin. Father, maybe there are people here this morning that are walking away from you. They want to experience the, the, the real Jesus in their lives. Somebody here this morning, probably somebody here, wants to accept Jesus today. Somebody here is walking away from the Lord. You're Christian, but you're walking away from him. I'm going to invite you this morning to come to him.